promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. The American Broadcasting Company presents another in a series of dramatic programs, The Clock. watch will run indefinitely, neither too fast nor too slow. And what little regulation it may need is usually minor. The same can be said of the normal mind. But a watch that has been tampered with exaggerates the passage of time. The wheels may run too slowly or too fast. This is not always apparent to the casual observer, however, at least on the surface. And the human mind that becomes abnormal is not always an easily detectable thing, even though that mind may house an appetite for murder. They told me at the hospital that I was the homicidal type. Can you imagine me? A perfectly normal girl with a sweet disposition. I guess that's why I didn't like the place. Everybody was nuts in the joint but myself. So one night I found a loose bar in one of the windows and I let myself out by climbing down some knotted bed sheets. <laughs> Say, they must have been a sight to see when they found out I was gone. And I took my nail file with me. When I reached St. Louis, I naturally got myself a job. I'm a manicurist. But only for men, see? And if I say so myself, I can dress up any barbershop in town. When the bald heads let me hold their fingers, they forget about their business trouble. And they always feel at home with a nice, sweet, respectable girl like me. So your name is Mabel? Yeah, what's yours? Charlie. I used to know a Charlie once in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> and he was just as cute as you. <laughs> Left hand, please. How long you been around here, Mabel? Oh, just a little while. You got any boyfriends? One or two. But uh, nothing steady, huh? No. Say, that's a classy ring you got there. Four carrots. The stick pin's five. You must be rich. I get by. And I don't mind spending either when I meet a classy number, Mabel, like you. You're squeezing my hand. That's what it's for, ain't it? It all depends on who's doing the squeeze. What's on your date book for tonight? Nothing much. Movie, maybe. And then to bed. You want to make that a nightclub and a show? I might. When do you knock off here? Six. I'll be outside waiting, baby. Five minutes of. And I'll be looking for you. Charlie. He took me to a chop suey joint and then we found a bar. The floor show was rotten, so we didn't stay too long. And Charlie wanted to go for a nice long walk in the park. But he got tired even quicker than I thought he would. And we sat down on a bench right near the lake. Ah, it's quiet here. Yeah. And we're all alone. You're going to try to get fresh now, Charlie? <laughs> you know the routine. Are you married? Yeah, but my wife don't understand me. That's how it goes. But you're the kind of a girl who does. From the minute I met you, I figured you were just my type. You know, Mabel, I could go for a kid like you. Nice, sweet kid. Big, blue, innocent eyes. He looked at me and I looked at him. And then he bent over to give me a kiss. I remember his face smelled from some kind of a shaving lotion. And I noticed the sweat on his upper lip as I opened my handbag and took out the nail file. And I also remember how his eyes bulged out like marbles as I jammed the file through the back of his wrinkled neck. I didn't do it for the diamonds or the wallet. Although I figured I might as well take them with me as long as he wasn't going to use them anymore. And anybody who says I did it for the diamonds ought to be ashamed. I did it because I liked to do it. I don't know why. And a girl's got to have a little fun every once in a while. The next one I met was Alfred. And he was a doll. 
And it wasn't long before we got well acquainted. So you're in the messenger business? Well, not exactly. I mean, I don't own the firm. I'm just one of the bonded carriers. What's that? Well, we carry stocks and cash from one place to another. That's about all there is to it. Right hand, please. Uh-huh. I bet that's dangerous. My work? No. You see, most people on the street don't even know I got something valuable in my briefcase when I make a delivery. And besides, I carry a gun. Oh, a gun? <laughs> don't be afraid, Mabel. I ain't got it with me now. I used to know a fellow named Alfred in Dallas, Texas. Did he look like me? Not half so nice. Uh-huh. I never met a girl who was half as nice as you. Oh, are you just saying that to kid me? No, on the level, I mean it. You married, Alfred? No, but I hope to be someday. You'd be a nice catch for any girl. I don't make too much dough, even though I carry a lot of it around. But if a girl don't mind a movie and a glass of beer, I, I can provide her with an entertaining evening. Don't sound bad. How about him, Mabel? I'll let you know. I usually make my last delivery on Friday afternoon about 3 o'clock. I could meet you later and we could step out. Where's your office, Alfred? On Front Street. Oh, say, that's funny. I live on Revere. That's three blocks away. You want me to call for you? Sure. At at 4 after I make my delivery? Okay, Alfred, at 4. But give me your office phone number just in case something comes up and i got to call it off. I'll put it down, but but try to keep the date, Mabel. I promise you'll have fun. If I keep it, Alfred, I know I will. I got off at 1 on Friday, and at 2.30 sharp, I called the number Alfred gave me. I don't know why, I just couldn't wait until 4. I guess I just had a yen or something, and I was looking for excitement. Alfred? Yeah? This is Mabel. Oh, hello. You're not calling off our date? No, no, I just want to make it sooner, that's all. Sooner? Can you pick me up in 15 minutes? But I got a delivery to make. I'll make it with you. Don't you want company? It's against the rules. Oh, don't be like that. I'm lonesome. And besides, some guy's been pestering me all day. He's dying to take me out, and he said he might come over. I I want to avoid him if I can. You calling from Revere Street? Yes. Number 71, where I live. Hurry, Alfred. And then after you make that delivery, we'll have some fun. Okay, baby. I'll be right over. And I'll be waiting. I don't know what made me lie that way. I don't live on Revere. And I don't know what made me go to number 71 and hang around the hall. Ha, I must be mischievous, huh? I guess I'm just a card. Alfred? Oh, hello, kid. I thought I'd wait for you here in the hall and save time. Let's get going. I want to get rid of this package of money I got and quit for the day. Oh, you're cute, Alfred. What? You're really cute. Uh-huh. You think so? And you and I are going to have lots of fun. Oh, dear. What's the matter? The bow on my shoe just got on top. Oh, here, let me do it. Oh, you darling. No trouble, Mabel, no trouble at all. No trouble at all. He had curly hair, and I could see it needed cutting when he bent over to tie the bow. And the curls ran down the back of his neck to the point where I stuck the file. Oh, the papers were full of it, and you can imagine what they said. Messenger robbed of 10,000 in cash. <laughs> the liars, it was only 9,804. And then he said he was killed for the money, ain't that a sketch? The smirch on a nice girl's reputation like that, when all I wanted was a thrill. The feel of the file as it went through his neck. <laughs> it almost made me giggle. And a girl's got a right to catch herself a laugh. The next week, I left my job and set myself up in a fancy flat. I got some snappy clothes in the high-class shops. And when I walked down the avenue, I looked like a lady. It was one of those walks, by the way, when I first met Harry. Oh, excuse me. You talking to me? Yeah, you happen to know where High Street is? On the other side of town, just follow this avenue. Thanks a lot. You going my way? Well, yes. You like a lift? I guess I wouldn't mind. Good. Hop in. I don't want you to think I do this as a regular practice. Oh, no. I mean, I'm not the kind who lets herself get picked up by any Tom, Dick, or Harry. (laughs) That's funny. What is? That's my name. Harry? Yeah. What's yours? Mabel. Glad to know you, Mabel. The feeling is mutual. Where are you bound for? I'll take you wherever you want to go. I'm not particular. No kidding? Well, in that case, how about some lunch? I know a place pretty close. Maison Rouge. Frenchy? Uh-huh. Oh, I say that sounds good. You know I'm crazy about frog's legs. Uh, your own ain't doing so bad. Now, don't be so chummy. 
How about it, Mabel? Should we put on the feedback? Did I say no? Okay. It must have cost plenty. It didn't come cheap. What line of business are you in? I'm retired. You mean it? <laughs> well, it's like being retired. I make my dough the easy way. On what? Horses. You raise horses? No, I play them. I play anything, baby. As long as it pays off good. You're a gambler. Yeah, that's the idea. I never met a gambler before. And you got a treat coming, kid. Watch your driving use two hands. <laughs> yeah, you and I will get along, Mabel. Oh, sure. We'll get along. Just fine. <laughs> He took me out every night for a week, and we had a lot of fun. He had money to burn, and he spent it like a scorn. That's why I was kind of sorry when our friendship had to end. Hello, Mabel. Say, what's the big idea? I've been waiting on this corner for 20 minutes. Well, sorry I was late, honey. I had a little business to attend. Look. Harry, where did you get all that money? Crap game. Big one. Joe Laurie was in on it, and Louis Crane, two big shot gamblers. And the luck was running for baby. How much money is in that roll? Fifty grand. Oh, I didn't think there was that much money in the world. There's more where that came from, honey. And baby's gonna get it. Now, how about we celebrate, huh? I know a classy roadhouse just outside of town. You mean you're gonna carry all that cash around with you? Why not? A bank in the morning. I'd just as soon have it on me as leave it at home. It's safer with me. After all, who have I got to be afraid of? You? Mm, that's a laugh. I scream when I see a mouse. <laughs> what you need is to protect you, honey. Somebody like you? Why not? You're too innocent to be running around without a guy to keep an eye on you. And I'm setting myself up as candidate number one. Come on, Harry. Let's go to that place you talked about. I'm dying for dance. Me too. Then maybe later on we can get better acquainted. Drive, Harry. Yeah, sure. No question about it. You had a lot to drink? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. That place was nice. I gotta go back there one day. You mean we gotta go back, don't you? Uh, sure. We. What are you doing? Filing my name. There's some file you got there. Looks more like a stiletto. <sighs> oh, Harry, you're <laughs> tired. No, no, I ain't. It's dangerous to drive when you're tired. Why don't you park for 15 minutes and take a little nap? Here? In the woods? Mm. You can rest on my shoulder if you like. That's what I call an offer I can't refuse. Am I crowding you, Mabel? No. Rest your head over here. Uh, you know, you were right. I am a little tired. I told you. If I grab a couple of winks, don't forget to wake me up. You huh? go to sleep, Harry. You'll get a nice rest. The drinks made him good and sleepy, and he closed his eyes. He was so quiet out there and so peaceful. And poor Harry was so very, very tired. That's why I figured I did him a good turn. You see, he didn't have to wake up anymore at all after I slid the nail file into his throat. <laughs> When a man gambles with a deck of cards, his luck might run for hours. When he risks his neck in a speeding car, he's fortunate if it lasts for minutes. But no one can set a time limit on how long your luck will run when you're getting away with murder. Well, by that time, I guess I was just about the happiest girl alive. I had everything I wanted, didn't I? Well, almost everything. Because after all, even $50,000 just goes so far. When I first saw Brandon, I got a jingle up and down my spine. Charlie was fat and Alfred was cute and Harry was tough. But Brandon was elegant. My, oh my, but he sure was class. When he knocked on my door that first night, he was wearing evening trousers and patent leather shoes and a red silk dressing gown that only went halfway down, just like in the movies. And he had a monocle stuck in one eye and a long cigarette holder. And the way he talked, you just wanted to listen all day long. I beg your pardon. I do hope I'm not disturbing you. Oh, not at all. I wonder if I could borrow a lemon. A lemon? Yes, an ordinary lemon. Oh, I sure. Thank you kindly. I need the lemon because I'm mixing a drink for myself. Uh, 
tall drink to cool the inner man. Tall drinks are nice, especially when it's hot. True, very true. Uh, would you care to join me in my flat? I, I don't mean to be rude, of course, and please forgive me if I appear too forward. Oh, but that's, I'm... that's all right. We're neighbors, so I'm not insulted. What's your name? Brandon. And yours? Mabel. Happy to know you, Mabel. We really should have met before. Well, there's nothing like making up for lost time, and we can start right now. I'll bring the lemon. Todd, we haven't met before. We've both been living here for over a month. I noticed you in the elevator one day. I remember because you were wearing spats. <laughs> Where are you from? California. My father was a rancher, and when he died, I left home. My father made a lot of money, and he never had time to enjoy it on his air. I'm from New York, Mabel, and I'm more or less of an heir myself. Really? My father was an Englishman, Sir Brandon Montague. Perhaps you've heard of him? I don't know much about foreign. Of course, my mother was American, and so am I. I used to know a man named Brandon in Dallas, Texas. Uh -huh, no relation of mine, I'm sure. Uh, will you have another drink? Why not? Oh, I like your apartment, Brandon. Oh, well, it's not quite what I had in mind, but in times like these. Who's the lady in that painting on the wall? Oh, my first wife. Dolores. Beautiful, isn't she? I'll see. We were divorced some years ago. I'm footloose and fancy free now. Me too. It's got its advantages, but then you get lost. Yes, I know how it is. However, when one is lucky enough to meet someone as charming as you, Mabel, one thanks one's lucky stars for being free. Oh, now, isn't that sweet? Here's your drink. Here's good health. Yes, good health. <laughs> Brandon and I saw a lot of each other. And my goodness, but he sure was smart. He knew all about everything, like, like Latin and algebra. To say nothing of how to compliment a girl. We used to talk and talk in his apartment or in mine. And believe it or not, he never made a pass. A gentleman, that's what he was. A perfect gentleman. And some of my ancestors on my father's side came over with William the Conqueror. Uh, to England, I mean. Oh, you sure have got a family history, Brandon. And you? I'm just a rich man's daughter. Who's looking for a friend? I'd be honored if you accepted me into that category. Then can I ask your advice? Oh, please do, concerning anything. I'm anxious to invest some money. In what? Some safe. I feel it ain't right to have all that dough just lying around. I want to put it to work. Well, there are several worthwhile investments I know of. I happen to be an investor in several of them myself. Of course, I do have one idiosyncrasy. What's an idiosyncrasy? Huh? How about you said? Oh, a constitutional peculiarity, more or less of a special peculiar characteristic. Oh. And my idiosyncrasy is a fear of banks. Yeah? Somehow I don't trust banks. I, I don't know why. Well, where do you keep your money? In a wall safe over there. I had it installed by an expert. It contains my valuables and my cash. Most of it, at any rate. Say, hey, that's a swell idea. Uh, I find it keeps me free from worry. My investments, of course, are fully protected by my brokers. I've got about $50,000 I want to invest uh, as a starter. Well, let me speak to my representatives about it, Mabel. I'm sure they'll make a few good suggestions. I'd appreciate it. You uh, wouldn't be interested in a wall safe, too, like mine. Uh, maybe I would. But how can you be sure a burglar won't get at it? Unless it's opened with the exact combination and no mistakes, an electric alarm informs the police. There's very little risk, of course. I guess you memorized the combination. Eh? No, not yet. I've only had the thing for about a month, and it's a very complicated formula. However, in a week or so, I'll destroy the paper with a combination on it. Well, I guess i got to go now, Brad. Oh, so soon? I have some shopping to do. Mabel, may I see you this evening? Aren't we seeing too much of each other? Oh, do you think so? It's been so wonderful being with you. I've kept no track of time. I'll be home again about 9 o'clock tonight. May I drop in on you for a nightcap? No. If you don't mind, I'd rather come here. <laughs> I got home to my apartment about 8.30 and changed into a fancy dress. Then I slipped my file into my evening bag and went across the hall to have a little fun with Brandon. You look charming, Mabel. Perfectly charming. You look pretty slick yourself. I've mixed the drinks already, so let's have an eye opener. Well. Here's to a long life for both of us. Down the hatch. Brandon. Yes, dear. Why don't you ever try to kiss me? I beg your pardon? You're the first man I've ever met who didn't make a pass. I have more respect for you, Mabel. But ain't she even human? Yes, very human. I've thought of kissing you many times. Well, who's stopping you? I'm only human myself. He took me in his arms and kissed me hard. And then he bent his head to kiss my hand. I felt like crying almost when I took the nail file out. 
He was going to look so messy in his fancy suit when I finished. As I raised my hand to give him the works... Brendan. Yes? What have you got on your neck? That is a very open bandage I cut myself. Oh. Are you going to file your nails? Well, I thought... Oh, give me that file like a good girl. It can wait till tomorrow. Sure. Everything can wait until tomorrow. Especially when you're in love. Well, I couldn't jab him with that big bandage of cotton on his neck. And besides, he had the file. I was really surprised at Brandon for disappointing me like that. After all, he was such a gentleman. But when I left his flat a little later, we made a date for the end of the week. And I made sure to ask him for my file. <laughs> Hello. Brandon? Yes. This is Mabel. Mabel, where are you? I wanted to call you about our date tonight. I'm going to be out of town, and I think I'll be back too late. Oh, I'm so sorry. Of course, if you wanted to meet me with your car and drive me home... Well, I'd be delighted. I'm going to be all the way out in the sticks, Brandon, visiting a friend. If you could pick me up about now... Just tell me where. Oh, it's a little village 40 miles from here. It's got one drugstore, and I'll be waiting there. But wouldn't you prefer me to pick you up at your friend's house? No. No, that's not so good. You see, I'll have to make some kind of an excuse. And I don't want my friend to be insulted. All right, Mabel. In front of the Portstown Drugstore at nine. And then we can take a nice long ride together. Through the woods. I took a train to Portstown, and I was in front of the drugstore by 7.30. I figured I could let him have it in the car, like I did with Harry. And he'd be carrying the key to his apartment. Somewhere in the desk, maybe, I'd find that combination. Of course, I wasn't doing it for the money. And anybody who says so just doesn't have any respect for a lady. Like always, I was really doing it for fun. Well, you wouldn't believe it, but I stood there until 11. Can you imagine that and Brandon never showed up? By a quarter to twelve, I got tired of hanging around, so I took the last train back to St. Louis. It was certainly ungentlemanly of Brandon to stand me up that way, but he was full of apologies when he called me the following day. You don't know how awful I feel about it, Mabel, but my car broke down just after I left my flat. I'm so terribly sorry, dear. Well, I don't know if I'm going to forgive you, Brandon. Ah, oh, you must. And besides, I've made up for it just a little. Hmm? How? I spoke to my broker, and he's going to make a wonderful investment for you. He's got a tip on the market, and he'll turn your $50,000 into a million. Oh, that sounds fine. Can you get the cash and bring it over to my apartment tonight at 8? Well, all right, Brandon, anything you say. You can trust me. You know you can. Magic. The next day, I made sure there was going to be no slip-up. I brought a load of sleeping pills along with me, and I slipped them into Brandon's drink. He was so cute when he started to get sleepy. The radio was on, and he was trying to keep himself awake. Oh, I don't know what's wrong with me tonight, Mabel. I <laughs> feel so groggy. Maybe you want to take a nap? No, no. That isn't very nice when one has company. However, let's get on with our little business. You, um, you have the cash. It's in my bag. Then you'd better let me have it. No, Brandon. Yes, Mabel. All right, Brandon. I'll let you have it. Now. He was flat in his back asleep when I opened my purse. And he didn't feel a thing when I jabbed the nail file through his neck. I found the combination, too, and I got his dough. There wasn't much. Not as much as I thought. And I was just about to leave when I felt kind of funny. There was... There was something that hit my leg. Then traveled up paralyzed me in a way. I, I tried to think if there was something I ate, but, but all I had was the drink he mixed for me. And then, and then I heard a voice. Now here is a special Just news bulletin. Just I seemed to be passing on myself. It was coming from the radio. I guess not. I tried very hard to listen. Brandon Montague, homicidal maniac, a man who has killed three women for their money. Five feet ten, suave manner, monocle in left eye. Brandon Montague is wanted by the police. His favorite method for murder is a poisoned drink. So that's how it goes. Brandon Montague, the 
sky I trusted. I, I ain't even got strength enough to reach the fall. The only thing I sure would like to know is whether Brandon got as much fun out of it as I did. <laughs> Perhaps Mabel never knew it, but she supplied the answer to a riddle that is almost as old as time. <laughs> she demonstrated what would happen when the irresistible force met the object that was immovable. Clock will be heard again next week, same time, same ABC station. This program was written by Lawrence Clee, directed by Clark Andrews. Music tonight was under the direction of Ralph Norman in the absence of Bernard Green. Heard on tonight's program were Fran Lafferty as Mabel and Charles Webster as the voice of the clock. This is Bill Crago speaking. Listen again next week, same time, for The Clock. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Sunrise and sunset. Promise and fulfillment. Birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Many thousands of years ago, when man was still sporting a bearskin coat, a matted beard, and a taste of raw meat, he discovered fire. He used this remarkable new invention to warm himself, to protect his people from their natural enemies, and to work it. A little later, he found out that his meat was tastier when cooked, and fire became an even greater boon. Still later, fire was used to propel a boat or run an engine, and in the course of time, it became a necessity of life. But although fire had been harnessed, it was never subdued. Civilization must always be on its guard against it, for all it needs is a guiding hand and a demented mind to run completely wild. What time is it now? Uh, that's really sudden. She'll be here in a minute now. Who? Hmm? Oh. Mamie. Who's Mamie? Oh, Mamie. Because she doesn't listen when I talk to you. You know we've been without a cook and housemaid for over a week now, don't you? Uh, I haven't complained, have I? Not you haven't. I'm the one who had to do the cooking. Hmm. Well, I've had good luck. I put my meat papers with Bernie Simmons called up. He's coming here from interview tonight. Oh, good. Uh, where'd you put my paper? It's right there in front of your nose, darling. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Did I hope you didn't disappoint me? Oh. Mamie. Uh, who's Mamie, dear? So, oh, oh, never mind. Hmm. Well, I think I haven't caught her yet. What? So this pyromaniac was on the loose, a nickname The Flaming Chances. He started four fires in the past two months. Where are they? Yes, throughout the city. The last one was on the Street. But that's not far away from here. No. She started a fire in the basement, and three people were burned to death. Oh, horrible. Oh, well, they'll get it sooner or later. They put special police on the case. Why do people do things like that, Ralph? Hmm? Oh, well, I don't know. There's something wrong upstairs, I guess. They're fixed as well as criminal. Oh, yes. Oh, when Mamie gets here, let me do the interview. Hmm? I don't want you to scare her away. Scare her away? <laughs> What do I look like, a zombie? You're liable to say something treacherous, darling. Mm. You're not near home when the woman of the house is most of the talking. Mm. All right. I think you've got to hide this girl, Ralph. I'm just not going to be a drag around here any longer. Oh, honey, you know you're not. Oh, this is... This is hide, darling. Oh, would you like me to wear my dinner jacket? Good evening. Are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Where are you from? Well, I'm just going to say. Oh, please come in. 
Oh, Mimi, this is Mr. Cartwright. Hi, Mimi. Nice to meet you, sir. Thanks. Sit down, Mimi. Thank you. Uh, you can cook, of course. Yes, but only plain cooking. Oh, that's just what we want. We don't go into fancy dishes here. Isn't that so, Ralph? Hmm? Oh, oh, sure, sure. Well, now, this apartment has four rooms, and your room's in there next to the kitchen. There's a small radio on the table for your own use. I, I think you'll be very comfortable. Any washing, Mrs. Cartwright? Oh, no, no. We think I can help. Oh. The phone, of course, was Mrs. Miller. The phone is all right. Oh, well, that's fine. Then, uh, I suppose you move in tomorrow morning. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A reference. Uh, oh, yes. I imagine you have some, maybe. Is there anything about references in the air? <laughs> I know, but... Uh, <laughs> not that I want to be silly to you. You're tell us who you worked for last. I worked for a woman last in another state. I'll write you a reference if you want. Um, how long did you get there? Two years. I came here last month. I haven't been doing much since then. I thought I'd take a little rest. But now I want to go back to work again. And maybe, uh, what's this woman's name? Kent. And her Now, look, Mr. Cartwright, if you think I'm oh, lying... Oh, no, 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 please, please don't feel that way. Uh, you are Mrs. Kent, and so is the reference when you receive it. That's what? I'll do it tomorrow. Well, now, that's just about all. Uh, can we expect you at eight in the morning? I'll be here. Well, uh, if you're free, you can keep it with you. You've got Sundays off, and, uh... uh what is it, then? I was just wondering about the kitchen. Oh, you'll find it a very nice place to work in. There's good nothing to stay with those, don't you? What kind of a stove have you got? What kind? Electrical flame. Electric. Oh, too bad. <laughs> An electric stove is just as easy to cook on as a gas stove. I know a lot of people think so, but I don't. I always like the kind that had the flame. Yeah, just the office an hour sooner. Well, dinner ready, I'm starved. I'm only got it all, Mr. Kirk. I have to send out some tomatoes. Yeah. Well, did you find out any more about her? No, Ralph. No. The woman is sending for references. Oh, it's been a mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But you tell me a little bit about it, It's in 39, and the people were farming. They originally come from the country somewhere. Oh, I must have paid too far. Yeah. Oh, say, um... Listen, oh, I forget. I, I'd better wrap those matches. What matches? Well, those special giant barbecue matches I bought for Larry Wilson. It's just that Friday, and I want to send them out. Well, what did you do with the box? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's right here. Darling, I didn't do any matches. Oh, I couldn't have got lost. The box is over a foot high. Well, Mary cleaned the house today. Maybe she put them somewhere else. Well, I'll go and have a look for them. If I don't get that package out in the morning, I'll forget about it. Hey, did you find it? Oh, wait a second. Well, that's funny. Oh, you did find them. Yeah. Did I wear it? Yeah. Maybe it's real. Well, you were pretty good, Virginia. Oh, well, Mary was a much better cook than she pretends to be. <laughs> Well, she still has to pass the acid test when she cooks me a first class roast. <laughs> you want to talk to me, man? Yes, thank you. Oh, maybe. Yes, sir. Would you mind passing me that box of cigars? They're, uh, they're on the table. Yes, sir. Oh, say, I, I got a break today, but you know, Charlie Bolton came in with an order for 200. Hello, Arthur. Oh, thank you. That's me, Larry, for you, Mr. Cartwright. Oh, that's nice of you, then. Oh, as I was saying, Virginia, Sorry, Bolton came in. Hey, you did put that much down before you bury yourself. I won't burn myself, man. Is there anything else you want to ask, man? Oh, no, thank you, man. You can clear the business and have the evening off. I've got a club meeting tonight, and Mr. Cutler's going to a political meeting. Yes, man. You might take in a movie around the corner. Oh, I don't think so. I can find things to do that I enjoy. Thanks for the evening, man. Oh, that was odd. What was? Well, he wasted all that match because it almost burned her finger. That reminded us, sir. <laughs> if you hadn't forgotten about it, you'd be looking at it all the time. Well, let's not talk about it. Why did you think that would be? I can't. Oh, right. But I still think it was odd. Oh, that's funny. Oh, Good morning. 
Uh, good morning, Ross. Oh, there's Mamie. That's what I'd like to know. Did you come back last night, huh? I'm making all the tricks so you won't be late to work. No, you don't need to be left, do you? I hope not. The things are still in the room. Oh, Ralph, I wish you wouldn't talk about your dinner so much. You might be able to hear me. I don't blame you. I mean, you know, I never said anything to you. It's annoying, that's all. I get someone I love and she works one day and then she disappears. It's enough to drive a woman to distraction. <laughs> Maybe she went out on a bender. What? Well, who knows? She might be one of those lost weekends. We may be better off getting rid of her after all. Well, how can you say that? Uh, all right. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to stay out of your way. You're not in a very good mood today, dear. Uh, here's the morning paper. Where it always is at this time. Outside the door. Okay. Now, look at this. What is it? This headline here. Flaming Francis strikes again. What? The pyromaniac nicknamed Flaming Francis by the police set fire to another building last night on Harris Street. Well, it's just around the corner. Fortunately, the building had been condemned and was just about to be raised. No one was injured, although a fireman was overcome by smoke. It's right here in the neighborhood. Yes. That's Mamie. Yes. Mamie, all right. Morning. Good morning, Mamie. I'm sorry I didn't get back last night, but I didn't think it would until this morning anyway. Well, that's all right. You see, I went to visit a sick friend. She had no one to take care of her. Uh, what's happened to your left hand, Mamie? Yes? Uh, why is it bandaged? Oh, it's nothing. I'll get my uniform on and start my work. All right, Mamie. Oh, no, thank goodness you think. It was all right, Mamie. Yeah. When? That bandaged kind of work. The bandage was padded, and, and part of it seemed to be stained with some kind of lotion. What about it? It's the kind of bandage I see sometimes on, on a very bad day. gone like smoke from a burning ember can never be reclaimed. But the ember can perpetuate itself. Given fuel enough, it can ignite and spread. And there are those who receive a strange exhilaration as they watch the flames march down, leaving death and desolation in their wake. We've got to get rid of that, Virginia. But please, Ralph, let's not be hungry. I've got half a mind to call the police. And what will you say to them? What have you got to keep the woman there after? Oh, I did it to all circumstances, but I'm not taking any chances. But, Ralph, if you call the police, Mrs. Innocent, as I'm sure she is, don't believe it. What you don't seem to realize, Virginia, is that we may have a dangerous maniac in the house. We've simply got to protect ourselves whether we lose her or not. Oh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll call the police right now while she's out, and I'll have one of their men come over tonight. I oh, can't wait until tomorrow. Listen, I couldn't do any work at the office today because I was worrying so much. I saw her burning the, the whole block of flesh down with you in it. Oh, Ralph, you've just got a big imagination. Well, that's how I feel about it. And I'm calling the authorities. When did Mary say she'd return? She said about 10.30. She was going to the picture. Well, for all we know, she may be trying to burn down a couple of hospitals just to keep herself in sin. No, I'm definitely going to get the police. <laughs> And as you said, you hired this girl two nights ago. Uh, yes, Sergeant. She answered an ad in the paper. Did she give any references, Mrs. Carplank? We asked her for them, and she said she'd write to the last place she worked at, in another state. Uh, well, it would take at least a week to get a reply, if her story was true. Uh, we can check on it later. Sergeant, don't you think it may have been a coincidence? The burn on her hand, I mean. Very easily. Oh, frankly, I, I wasn't even sure it was a burn, but under the circumstances... You did the right thing, Mr. Carplank. Of course, you're taking any chances. This is your she can prove it soon enough. Now, let's have a look at her room. Yes, all right. Uh, come with me. Uh, may we take in here? Not her suitcase? Yes. Okay, let's have a look at it. Have you any other clues? No, not yet. This is the first date you've had. Hmm. Well, that doesn't seem to be anything here. Well, what are you doing with my suitcase? Oh, no, uh, We didn't think you'd be back so soon, Mamie. I was afraid it was slid into my suitcase. Now, just a minute. Uh, Mamie, this is just... Sergeant King. A policeman? Yes. I'd like to ask you a few questions. I haven't done anything. I'm not a thief. We're not looking for a thief, Mimi. Uh, what happened to your hand? I heard it. How? I... I burned it. Where? On a stove? Yes. In my friend's house. She told me she was going to give it to her friend uh, on the night of the last time. Stop fire. Mimi, I'm afraid I'll have to take you down to headquarters. You're arresting me? No, we just want to question you. If you answer that question in the right way, we'll let you go inside an hour. But what have I done? What do you think I mean? All right, Mamie. Come along quiet. That's very right, folks. I knew I should never take him his rotten job. Come on, Mamie. I'll cut the hands off me. I can walk by myself. Here. 
Well, that's that. I guess he's lucky for good news. He was guilty. I could see it in her eyes. She was scared to death when she saw that detective. <laughs> One you were after? Looks that way. Now that you made a break. I have a pretty man scouring the city for her. Keep an eye on your face, too. So, uh, if she shows up here, I'll turn her in immediately. I uh, hope I didn't scare your wife. Uh, well, uh, I'll take care of that. Supposing that's how that you know. You'll make this cut right for your ear. Uh, uh, thank you. I advise you to take Lucy in the court. Remember, she's a dangerous woman. Yes, I, I, I'll keep my eyes open. So, uh, thanks for calling, Sergeant. Good night. Good night. Well, I'm scared. Now, Virginia, there's no need to be scared. There's nothing to be frightened about. But I am. She's liable to come back and set fire to the apartment. She's not at all likely to come back. I won't stay here until she's caught well. Now, look, Virginia. I just couldn't sleep all night. Oh, darling, let's go to a hotel. A hotel? Oh, no, that's silly. Besides, well, someone ought to be here in case she returns. It's perfectly all right. I can handle that. I can rock. Would you really mind if I stayed overnight somewhere else? Somewhere else? Look, do it. I could go to your sister's place. You know, she left the key once you went away on holiday. It's just after 11. You know, I, I don't like you to go across town at this hour alone. Well, I'll take a cab in front of the door. I, I suppose that'll be all right. And, uh, and call me when you get there. All right, darling, I will. Oh, dear. Please be careful. Don't worry, darling, I will. I'm glad if I shut my eyes for the rest of the night. Mankind took many centuries to make a fire a good servant. But it takes only a few minutes for the good servant to turn into a destructive monster. Let's follow the fortunes of plain and fancy. This is Papa. Please, don't make a sound. I had a knife in my bag and I know how to use it. What do you want? You thought you were pretty clever, didn't you? Calling the police. Well, I'm clever. I was feeling you'd leave your house tonight when you found out I'd got away and I've been waiting for you. Maybe. You're being very busy, thank you. Tell me what I am. Well, you people are alike. You pay out money and you think I'm a slave. What are you talking about? Think you can buy the world, don't you? You think having money is everything when it isn't. Oh, right, it isn't. Now, if you'll just let me know, Mrs. Carter. You're not getting a chance to call the police and tell them you're still. I, I don't know. You're sitting coming with me. I want to prove something to you. What do you think of this man who isn't everything? I'm going to tell you a bigger thing. Only, I mean, what do you mean? You'll find out. Come with me. It isn't very far. Well, Miss Alley, where are you taking me? She's walking with this top right. We're going into the cellar. Any steps? Open the door. It's so dark in here. You know what the building is? It's a warehouse. You know what they say? That's Texas. I hope I love it most. I'll show you something. What are you finding in those doors? No smoking. Do not like smoking. <laughs> The flames come up as loud as a fire, and I'll leave you here to enjoy to the finish. Don't be a fool, Manny. I wouldn't do anything. Not, not you wouldn't. You, you don't know anything about me, do you? But you're going to learn into something right now. Manny, that's one of those newspapers in that magazine. Those papers? What a fine job I do turn out to be. 
had expected such a shooting a blizzard. One match. What do you know about it? Oh, that's what I know. I know that you had nothing to do with the standard street fire. And the horror street there is another job that doesn't mean to you. How do you know? Because I started them both. And I didn't do it with a match either. Better on the level? Yes. Okay. I'll show you something else. 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 I'd just love to see the flames as they lift their way from tool to tool. I'd just love to smell the smoke as it clears up in the sky. Oh, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful watch that comes to me in the sky. It's a cloud rock. What about the uh, husband? Do you know anything about this cloud? Don't oh, have the fool. You'd never understand. Okay, you do know what you do. I do. You know what sort of people hear the crackle of a burning tool. You know what the sparks are. Here, you'll take this part. I went on this side, and also mine over here. I put it there. I'm going to go outside and watch for me. Well, what? I'll be lost again. Come, come at me. Come. Come on. 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 Come this woman is taking on the fort. We had an idea of you behind those bars. You were seen in the neighborhood of two of them. We needed a little more proof. I'll tell you, Al. All right, claiming Carter. Let's get started. Oh, it's a pretty fire, isn't it? Oh, it's so clean. It's so clean inside. I just wanted to get one last look. that flaming Francis might have found appropriate. Fire can only be fought in turn with fire. The clock will be heard next week, same time, same station. Written by Lawrence Clee and narrated by Hart McGuire, you heard as Virginia, Margot Lee. As Mamie, Margaret Christensen. As Ralph, John Bushell. And as the sergeant, Max Austin. The clock... Directed by John Paul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. The human mind reacts in two separate ways. While we're awake, our conscious mind is more or less in command. While we sleep, the subconscious takes over. And time also undergoes a change between the waking and slumbering mentality. While we sleep, we seem to be able to cover a lot more ground in a lot less time. There's a theory, for instance, that a whole sequence of events which flash before us in a dream may pass in a matter of seconds, even though it might seem to us in our slumber that these events are taking hours to transpire. For our subconscious is energetic, and knows no restraints. And the power of suggestion can have a profound effect upon it. In fact, the power of suggestion can have a profound and agonizing effect upon our lives. There it is, Cora. That must be the house. That one? Oh, but it is beautiful. I, I can't believe it. Yes. Do you think they made a mistake in the ad? Oh, they must have a house like this completely furnished for only three pounds a week in this day and age. Well, maybe they've never heard of the housing shortage. Oh. Darling, we're only 30 miles from the city, not 30,000. <laughs> Even the dead must have heard of the shortage by now. Cora, 
Oh, I'm sorry, dear. I've got how superstitious you are. Uh, it's not that I'm superstitious. It's it's just that I, I don't like morbid jokes. Oh, don't mind me, Ted. I'm so sick and tired of looking for a place to live. I've lost my sense of humor. <laughs> It does get aggravating after a while, you know, to run from one hotel to another. And at those prices. Yeah. Oh, well, anyway, let's go and have a look. Oh, you know, I won't believe it's true until I see the lease. Just look at the way the place has been kept. Mm. It's, it's perfect. Well, the people that moved out of here must have been crazy. Uh, if we get in, they're crazy. They think we'll ever move out. <laughs> Ted chimes and everything. Oh, there's a catch in it somewhere. Yes. Uh, there was an advertisement in the papers uh, about renting this house. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, come in. Oh, thank you. Um, has anyone got here before us? Just two couples. Oh, no. I hope it's neither of them wanted to rent. No. What? The rent is uh, three pounds, isn't it? Three pounds a week, young man. Uh, are you the owner? Oh, no, no. I'm the caretaker. Mrs. Chelsea's my name. Oh, let me show you around. Mm. Now, uh... This is the living room. What? Oh, it's charming. Look, there's a piano in here and everything. But, Ted, the furniture's brand new. Oh, yes. The house itself is less than a year old. Uh, just come this way, please. Uh, this is, is the dining room. Oh, oh. rather look at that setup. Uh, does the crockery come with the house? Everything you see in here is included in the rent. Oh. <laughs> well, everything's oh. been left exactly the way the uh, former tenants left it. Uh, there are two bedrooms upstairs. Would you like to see them? Um, wait a minute, Mrs. Chelsea. What's the catch? Cora. Well, we may as well face it, Ted. The place is too much of a bug. <laughs> is it haunted, Mrs. Chelsea? Oh, look at <laughs> Not that we'd mind a few ghosts. <laughs> Heaven knows we have to share with everything else. Well, the house isn't haunted, and there are no ghosts. Well, then what's the trouble? Why did the last two couples turn it down? I don't know. Uh, do you want the house? Uh, Cora, please, let me handle this. Uh, look, Mrs. Chelsea, we're we're anxious to take this place. Now, if there actually are no hitches to the lease, we'll sign it right now. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> I'm getting a little tired of all those silly people running in and out that way. It's easy to see that the place is worth three times the money, and simply because it... Never mind. Uh, I'll get the lease ready. Ted, wait a minute. Well? Ted, why on earth do you think this place is so easy for us to get? Maybe it's Dan. No, no, I, I was thinking about those other people that Mrs. Chelsea mentioned. Are you coming in to sign? I have the lease ready. Well, Cora, what do you say? Mm, all right, Ted. There's no point in being silly about it. I only hope we don't regret it. Look on this table, Ted. Oh, wonderful. Where did you get those zinnias? From the garden. Aren't they lovely? I'll say. Oh, you know, whoever was here before us had very good taste. <laughs> you mean the, uh, the ghosts? Ted, get a new joke. <laughs> you were the one who brought it up. I know, but <laughs> you were just as suspicious as I was. Only a little more sensible. All right, darling, you can preen yourself. Well, we've been here a week. No ghosts, no visions. <laughs> Not even a measly chain rattling. I know. It's very disappointing. I was really hoping to meet a ghost or two. Oh, you were? Yes, I was. A nice ghost, like my great-grandfather, maybe. He was a lovely ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Your great-grandfather, maybe. <laughs> I wonder he wouldn't use the chime. Old-fashioned, that's all. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Am I disturbing you? Well, why, no. I'm Eve Lawler, your neighbor. Oh, please come in. Thank you. I should say I'm your nearest neighbor. We're actually a quarter of a mile apart. Uh, you're Mrs. Bellows? Yes, yes. And this is my husband, Ted. How do you do? Glad to know you. I merely came over to make your acquaintance. And, uh, well, just to ask if there was anything I could do to make you more comfortable. Oh, thank you very much, Mrs. Lawler. But Mrs. Chelsea did an excellent job before she left. Oh, yes, Mrs. Chelsea... I met her once or twice. She must have been rather relieved when you signed your lease. I know she's been trying to get someone in here for weeks so she could leave and take another job. Why is it she had so much trouble? Yes, she wouldn't tell us. <laughs> Ted and I thought there might be a couple of ghosts in the closet at first, but yes. we were disappointed. There are no ghosts as such, as far as I know. Uh, what do you mean, uh, as such? Well, I... 
Perhaps I shouldn't tell you what I mean. It would be so much more pleasant for oh, you. Oh, no, please. We insist. Really, this is getting to be the mystery of the year as far as we're concerned. There's no mystery to it. A couple named Hawthorne built this house and furnished it. Mm -hmm. A bank, your present landlord, bought it from them just before the end. What, what, what do you mean, just before the end? One night, Elsie Hawthorne was found sitting at that desk chair with a bullet through her head. Oh. And her husband, Bob, was found on the floor beside her, poisoned to death. Oh, that's horrible. But, but, but what happened? Why did they do it? Did they kill e each other? So the coroner surmised. Elsie poisoned Bob's drink, but he killed her before the poison took effect. Huh? So, so that's why people avoided the place. Oh, it's pretty bad. Oh, well, things like that will happen. They must have both gone out of their minds. No. There's no indication that either of them was insane. I saw them both only the day before the murder. If they were crazy, they didn't show it. But what was the motive? There was no motive. Oh, that's impossible. Oh, every crime has a motive. A man or a woman may kill for money or, or out of passion. If they kill for any other reason, it's, it's plain insanity. They had a reason, but no one ever found out what it was. The reason had something to do with this house. Uh, how do you mean? I can't explain it because I don't know. But once or twice... I detected a note of fear in Elsie Hawthorne's voice when she spoke of the house. A fear she never explained. But what was there about the house that frightened her? It's a perfectly charming place. We've been all through it. I can only tell you this, Mrs. Bellows. Something about this house drove those two young people to kill each other. I hope that you never discover what that something was. <laughs> Thank goodness she's gone. Did she worry you, Cora? She annoyed me. She didn't have to make such a movie mystery out of the story. Those two poor people. Now she's writing a whodunit around them just to amuse herself. I don't know. She She seemed to be so sincere. Hmm. I noticed you were impressed with her sincerity every time you looked at her legs. Oh, now, darling. Yes, I'm jealous, Ted. <laughs> I'm jealous of every woman you meet. Especially the gorgeous ones like Eve Lawler. Oh. What could it have been there? What could have made those two people murder each other? Ted, I don't know, and I don't care. All I can say is that Mrs. Hawthorne had excellent taste, and I, I'm crazy about her house. Have you really been all through it, Cora? Well, almost. While you were at work, I went through most of the stuff upstairs in the rooms we don't use. Find anything? No. What would you expect me to find? I don't know. She's got some very interesting things here. They're anything but creepy. What about that desk? Oh, it's locked. Haven't you tried to open it? Ted, why should I want to open it? I use the desk in our bedroom. I just thought you might have been curious. Well, even if I wanted to open it, I couldn't. I don't have the key. I could force it open with a knife. You have no right to do that. It doesn't belong to us. Mm, I guess you're right. Well, let's forget about it. Ted? Yes? Uh, have you ever noticed the color of this room? Noticed it? Sure. Oh, what color are the walls? Brick red. No, they're not. You look again. It's funny. If you keep staring at them, the, the color seems to run. I mean, the shade changes. Yes. Oh, uh, it's just the way the light comes in through those windows, that's all. Uh, the, the shadows it throws are deceiving. And... Oh. I'm trying to think of what this color reminds me of. It doesn't remind me of a thing. The color just seems to run, that's all. That's it, Ted. What is it? The color running. Ted, a long time ago, I, I, I saw a man who was killed in an accident. He, he was just lying there in the street, Ted. These walls, they remind me of the blood that was running down his face. slowly for someone who watches the clock. And if you keep your eye on the hour hand, you'll find it moves with exasperating languor. 
and fear can enter into the mind with a sluggishness that is even less perceptive. But once there, it grows to a monstrous size with extraordinary speed. Good evening. Oh, you startled me. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you ring. I knocked. Evidently, you were so busy you didn't notice. The door was open. We have chimes, you know, and they work. I never use those chimes. Why not? Because Bob Hawthorne hated them so. What are you doing? Uh, nothing. Are I... you trying to force that desk open? Well, I, I was just wondering what was inside. I don't have a key. I don't think you'll find anything of interest. Bob didn't use it very much. You seem to know a great deal about the Hawthorns. I... I, I saw them on and off for almost a year. We often played bridge together. Elsie was a very interesting woman. Yes, I imagine she was. You have probably admired her interior decorating. I think it's charming. Elsie had a reason for everything, and she picked up some interesting souvenirs. She had a preoccupation with death. Uh, how do you mean? Everything was a symbol to her. Those vases, for example, on the fireplace mantel. Do you know what they mean? Why, no. They're Indian, aren't they? Mayan. The figures portray a sacrificial ceremony. This figure over here is a Mayan chieftain, and this is a sacrificial victim. But what is he doing? Tearing her living heart out. That's very interesting, if just a bit barbaric. Some of us are no more civilized today. There are more ways than one to tear the heart out of a woman. Is Ted at home? Ted? I mean, your husband. No, he hasn't returned from work yet. I run into him very often in the morning. Do you? Yes, we've met on the train going into town. I see. Your husband is very handsome, Mrs. Bellows. Lots of women seem to think so. He's almost as good looking as Bob was. You seem to have been very fond of Bob Hawthorne. He was very nice. I'm sorry you couldn't get that desk door open. I'm a little curious myself now to see if there's anything in it that may have belonged to Bob. Well, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to bother with it anymore. Well, I'll be on my way. Please do run in to see me sometime and uh, bring your husband with you. I say, what's the matter with you tonight, Cora? Oh, nothing, dear. You've been sitting in that chair for hours, staring at the walls. Why do you keep glancing at that desk all the time? Ted, let's open it. Open it? Yes, I... I tried to force it open myself this afternoon, but I couldn't. Will you try it? What for? I, I thought we gave up the idea. Ted, I've simply got to see what's inside that desk drawer. I'll get you a screwdriver and a hammer. Now, wait a minute. But they're right here in the kitchen. Oh, but, Cora, we can't damage someone else's property. Well, I'll have it refinished at our expense. Here, here you are, dear. I don't like this. Oh, go ahead, Ted, please. Oh, all right. Now look what I've done. I've busted the lock completely. Ted, open it. Nothing much in here. Just a couple of bills and a fountain pen and, and this. What is it? Well, it looks like a locket. Hmm. It's inscribed to Bob until death to his part. Oh, his wife probably gave it to uh, him. Let's see what's inside. Can you open it? I think so. There we are. It's a lock of hair. Blonde hair. It must have been Mrs. Hawthorne. No, 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 it couldn't be. Why not? I found an autographed picture of Elsie Hawthorne in the attic. She was a brunette. She was? But Eve Lawler is a blonde. Cora! Cora, honey? I'm in the living room, Ted. Oh, how's everything? About the same. I'm, uh, I'm sorry I was late tonight. I, I expected to be home at nine. Uh... It's midnight. Did I worry you? No, no. I knew you were in good company. What? You saw Eve Lawler this evening. Well, yes, Even I... Even walked you up the road. I saw you separate through the window. We met on the train. Oh, never mind the excuses. I know just what they are. They've been said before, as Elsie Hawthorne found out. Cora, what in the world is wrong with you? Surely you don't I think... found Elsie Hawthorne's diary, Ted. I've started to read it. Listen. In the beginning, it was innocent and unimportant. Later on, it grew. What grew? Bob's friendship for another woman. Now, listen to me, Corey. You've been acting pretty queerly lately. Are you sure you're all right? Why? Would you like to send me to a psychiatrist? Would you like to do what Bob Hawthorne tried to do, get his wife into our mental home? Cora! Oh, but forgive me, Ted. I, I don't know what's come over me. It must be this house. 
Oh, that diary. It's frightful. It? Cora, for heaven's oh, sake. Don't say any more. Just forget it and go to bed. <laughs> Oh, Mrs. Fellows, you asked me to pay you a visit. And so I have. May I come in? I'm I'm rather busy right now. Oh, how are you? Couldn't we make it some other time? Yes, yes, of course. Oh, and um, would you do me a favor? If I can. You might tell my husband that I'll be out for the evening. Your husband? Yes. You see, I happen to know that he's inside. <laughs> It's after two. What about it? Oh, honey, I've been waiting up for you all night. I, I, I wanted to explain. No explanations are necessary, Ted. I guess I should have told you that I intended to see Eve. Oh, no. so it's Eve now, is it? Well, it, it was all a perfectly innocent thing, Cora. I, I merely Look, dropped Ted, in. Ted, I can stand for almost everything, but there's one thing I won't tolerate. What's that? A liar. Good night. <laughs> It's time to do what Elsie did and put my thoughts down on paper. So, I'm keeping a diary. And in this diary will be found my thoughts, my hate, and my fears. Ted sees her often now. But he thinks I don't know. Heaven knows what they're plotting between them and how great her influence has become on my husband. For it was Eve Lawler who came between Elsie Hawthorne and her husband. And it was Eve who drove them both to their deaths. I'm sure now. I'm sure they mean to kill me. I have money in my own right, like Elsie had. Eve tried to sink her claws into Bob Hawthorne, but Elsie spoiled her plans. Now, Eve has made fresh plans, which include Ted and me. I've got to protect myself. But what can I do? I've got to put an end to all this now, before it's too late. Tonight. Tonight. Cora. <laughs> How did you get in here? Why, I saw the light under the door. What do you want? You're ill, Cora. I'm all right. You leave me alone. I asked you to see a doctor. I don't need a doctor. I think you do. Cora, I... I want to give up this house. Why? Because it's no good for either of us. You've got another reason. No, I haven't. Yes, you have. Eve Lawler must have put you up to it. Why? Why? As a matter of fact, I... I did see Eve, and she told me... Well, let's not talk about that now. It's... It's late, and I want you to get some sleep. I can't sleep tonight. I'm going to make sure you do. Well, I want you to take these pills. I knew it. Cora. I was waiting for that to happen, and now it has. You want to poison me. You want to kill me. Cora, for heaven's sakes, it's, it's just a sleeping pill. You planned pill. it between you. I know you have. You planned it the way she planned it with Bob Hawthorne, the way Elsie suspected. It's all in her diary, and it's all in mine. Cora. Cora, put that lens out. Don't come near me. Don't come near me. Do you hear? Cora. Hey. And let it burn. If I die, you'll die with me. Let it burn. Let it burn. Cora. Cora, darling, wake up. I, I had to knock you out to get you away from the house. The house is lit on fire. You threw that lamp at me. Don't you remember? Uh, yes, I remember. Cora, you, you don't know what I've been through since you've been acting this way. I, I tried to explain so many times that there was nothing between Eve and me. I saw her only because I wanted her to tell me the facts about the house. And then when I, I saw you were jealous, I, I I kept it from you to avoid more trouble. Ted, Ted is that the truth? That's the truth. And, Eve lied when she said there was no motive to the Hawthorne murder. There was. There was another woman, a, a woman who disappeared. It was her hair you found in that locket. 
Well, well I didn't leave tennis to handle. Because the woman was, was never found, and Eve was afraid she'd be suspected. Yes. Well, it, it took me a long time to get that out of her. But she finally confessed, and now she's, she's moving away. And so are we. The house... Completely in flames, too. Yes. Somehow I feel as though everything I feared, everything I hated is burning, too. The roof's gone, Cora. The house is practically in ashes. And so are those horrible thoughts I've had. The house gave them to me, Ted. It was like living in a crazy dream in that place. If a minute is lost or an hour, it cannot be found again. No detective in the world is clever enough to locate lost time. But when our peace of mind is momentarily gone, it can be located and restored to its proper place once more to remain with us, perhaps forever. The clock will be heard again next week. Lawrence Clee writes it and Hart McGuire narrates it. As Ted and Cora, we heard John Bonney and Dinah Shearing. Others were Muriel Steinbeck and Neva Carr Glynn. The clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Today. The passage of time has made a profound difference in the habits of the human race. But there are isolated spots where time could just as well have not existed for all the impression it has made. And there are people whose minds remain as savage and as barbaric as they were 10,000 years ago. But I have often wondered, just how great is the gap between these barbarians and ourselves? I have found the answer in a startling document which is known as The Scientific Observations of a True Barbarian by Professor Leonard Higgins. A scientific document must be written in great detail. And so I am setting down these observations in longhand for posterity. A few facts concerning myself may be in order to begin with, however, before we proceed to the experiment. Leonard Higgins is my name, Professor of Anthropology at Franklin University. Age, 47, married, no children. My wife is a most intelligent woman, and so it was only natural for me to broach the subject to her when the thought first entered my head. But it sounds fantastic, Leonard. Only because the notion is new, but, but, but it's logical. Uh, and I'd like to try the experiment with with one of the hedgefinkers of South America. Hedgefinkers? Deep in the jungles lives a tribe of savages whose instincts are no higher than the jaguars that roam through the same area. Now, it's the habit of this tribe to decapitate their enemies and shrink their heads to the size of an orange. The process is known only to them. Oh, and you propose to bring one of these people into this house? I hope to civilize this native girl completely within two months and disprove the theory that time alone can create the change between barbarism and civilization. I think it's a dangerous idea, Leonard. I kind of not like it. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry you feel that way. You see, Alice, my mind is set on it. I'm in the midst of my sabbatical vacation now, and, and I've time to get away. I wish you'd be reasonable about it and see my point of view. I need your help. My help? In what way? I want this savage to have the influence of a woman as well as a man. And you needn't be afraid, Alice. I'll have her well subdued and on her way to modern civilization, even before we arrive back. I arrived at my destination on Sunday and put in a call for Senor Barlos, who appeared at my hotel room an hour later. I then outlined my plan to him and asked for his cooperation. Well, this is very difficult, Senor Professor. I, I know it is. That, that's why I called on you. I believe you told me once that you traced part of your recent ancestry back to these aboriginal tribes. See, si, but that does not make me one of them. Oh, of course not. Uh, 
These people are savage. They hate all outsiders. It will be difficult to contact them. But can you do it? Perhaps, but you must buy some trinkets for me, bracelets, rings, anything that would interest a barbarian woman. I'll do that now. You say you want a young girl? Uh, yes, uh, about, uh, uh, about 20. She must accompany me with the full permission of her family, of course. Oh, naturally. And she must be bright. You see, I intend to teach her English, and she must be quick to learn. I understand. How long do you think it will take you to make this trip? Oh, perhaps two weeks. Uh, be careful. I don't want anything to happen to you, Barlos. Nothing will happen to me, senor. I know these people well. But if you will permit me to say so, it is you who must be careful after I return with the girl. Barlos was as good as his word. And exactly two weeks later, he returned. His task complete. Her name was Tiki, and she was extraordinarily pretty. She was still in her native dress when he brought her up to my room. And she looked like some tropical animal, straight from an Amazon swamp. Senor Higgins, this is Tiki. Well, uh, how do you do? She understands knowing less. Oh, of course. How stupid of me. How old is she? Twenty-two. And her family? She has none. She lived alone with her tribe. Her racial background seems to be Indian. Mm, si, senor. But no one knows exactly where these Indians came from. They are nomads, have been for centuries. Yes. <laughs> she looks gentle enough for a head shrinker. Yes. You see, she smiles at you. She likes you, Professor. <laughs> her, her teeth seem to be filed. Professor Higgins, I must warn you once more. This girl is unpredictable. She must be watched. <laughs> well, I have every intention of following all precautions. And, and now, there's one more thing I want you to do for me, Ballas. Eh? Give me a complete vocabulary list of her language. I, I take it she doesn't understand Spanish. No, her only language is the language of her tribe. Well, if I have most of the vocabulary, I'll be able to teach you a little English. And that will be the beginning of her education. And the end of her barbarian habits. I'll have the list for you by tomorrow, senor. Oh, fine. Uh, tomorrow night we'll leave for home. Mm. What's she carrying in that goatskin? Oh, some clothes, senor. And this. It, it's a shrunken head. See, si, and it's a present, senor, from your new pupil. The trip home by plane was uneventful. And I was very anxious for my wife to meet her. The a souvenir she gave me, I naturally hid away. I didn't want Alice to be frightened in any manner. And I intended to keep the object for study. Alice was waiting for us in the living room when we arrived. And she seemed to be pleasantly surprised. Uh, this is Tiki, Alice. Oh, Tiki? How do you do? Yes. <laughs> she, she only knows one or two words of English. Uh, what on earth is she doing? Oh, just taking off her shoes. She doesn't like them. Oh. Oh. She really doesn't seem to be as savage as I thought. Oh, she's very interesting. I, I was able to converse with her for, for a bit in her own language. And her tribal customs are rare indeed. Well, uh, we'll give her the guest room for the time being. Oh, fine. And I've prepared some lunch for both of you. Why not have a bite before you both unpack? Oh, good idea. <laughs> Tiki, eat? Eat? Yes. Much eat. <laughs> there you are. She's practically a linguist. <laughs> uh, let's sit down, shall we? Did you have a pleasant voyage back, Leonard? Oh, yes. Tiki like, likes to fly. <laughs> Tiki seems to be amenable to almost anything. Leonard. Yes, my dear? She's... Eating with her fingers. Oh, naturally. I haven't taught her how to use a knife and fork. Well, then suppose we begin right now. Uh, no. Let's wait for that. One thing at a time, Alice. What's wrong with her teeth? They're filed. It's a sign of beauty in her tribe. And also rather convenient. They dine mainly on raw meat. Well, that chicken's cooked and she seems to be enjoying it. Here, Tiki, let me take your plate and give you a helping of... <coughs> Tiki, Tiki, no. You shouldn't have done that, Alice. Shouldn't have done what? Take her plate that way. She thought you were trying to take the food away from her. But she... She reacts just like an animal. And for the time being, we must remember that's exactly what she is. How can we trust her when she reacts that way to a, a simple gesture? You leave Tiki to me. 
We'll all get along. Right, Tiki? Yes. <laughs> the weeks went by in which I managed to teach Tiki quite a bit of English. I was beginning to think my experiment would work. And she'd soon become a civilized young lady. When the first of a series of unhappy incidents occurred. Is she asleep, Leonard? Oh, yes. Tiki's been in bed for over an hour. <sighs> I think you've done wonders with her English. Mm -hmm. I can almost get a halfway decent conversation out of her now myself. Oh, she's really quite harmless. I'm almost ashamed of myself now for behaving so timidly. I've got big plans for Tiki. And I'm sure they'll make her happy. I want her to develop like an ordinary civilized girl. I was thinking I'd have Bob Williams in for dinner one evening. I'd like her to see how modern young people behave. Hmm. Yes, Bob Williams is an excellent suggestion. He's a smart young man. And I think he'd accept her tolerantly. Yes. Well, I think we ought to turn in, shall we? All right. Well, we'd better put the cat out. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Oh, she's probably in the cellar. I'll, I'll go down and see. Oh, I'll go with you, Leonard. Is the front door locked? Yes, dear. Oh, I'm glad we're turning in early. I'm tired. Uh, you stay here at the head of the stairs, Alice. This bulb's blown and I haven't replaced it. I'll go down and switch on the other bulb. Be careful, Leonard. It's so dark. No, I'm all right. Now, where's that switch? Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> Is the cat there, Leonard? Leonard? No, Alice. You go to bed. I'll, I'll join you in a moment. The, the, the cat isn't here. The cat was there. She was lying on the cellar floor near the furnace. She'd probably been dead for several hours. But the thing that startled me the most the thing I didn't want my wife to see was that its head was missing. Time is one thing that can't be hurried. And it's dangerous to try. But there is nothing that is half as risky as an attempt to change a leopard into a mouse. The following day, while Alice was shopping, I had a talk with Diggy. I didn't censure her or scold her. That would have been bad psychology. I only questioned her as though I were only mildly interested in what she'd done. Tiki. Yes? What happened to our cat? Cat? Uh, you know, the small animal, the, the kitten. Meow. Oh, cat. I fix head for you. You took the head to shrink it? Yes. How? Oh. Let me tell you. I, I know it's against your principles to give away the secret of the shrinking process, but... I'm curious to see how it's done. You want fix head? I want to watch you do it. Alice, come back. Oh, no. No, she won't be back for quite a while. Come. I show. She took me to a spot in the woods about 200 yards behind my house. She had a cauldron there, burning over a slow wood fire. Inside the cauldron was a sticky mess of roots and leaves and mud. And inside the mess I found what I expected to find. How long have you been doing this, Tiki? That last night. Then you must have sneaked out of the house. Make fire. Must burn three days. Six head. Three days, eh? Well, Tiki, you don't know it, but science has been mighty curious about this process of yours. And you're going to give me the entire formula. Formula? Yes. What inside here? You won't know? Very much. I tell you, maybe... I told Alice the cat had strayed away and made certain that Alice never went nosing around outside in the woods. As long as Tiki had confined her experiments to an animal, I wasn't too worried. Although, of course, I didn't condone the experiment in any form. However, Tiki didn't get into any mischief after that event. But Alice did. I've invited Bob Williams over tomorrow night, Leonard. Oh, oh have you, Alice? Yes, dear, I thought that's what you wanted me to do. Oh, I don't know, I... I've been wondering, Bob might be a little startled with the girl. Oh, but she's improved so much. Yes, yes, I, I suppose she has. And she's really just as gentle as a lamb. She even seems to have taken up sewing. Sewing? Yes, I found these needles in her room. They're odd-looking things, and they have no eyes. Now, let me see those, Alice. Did you... Did you find anything else? No, dear. Why? Oh, no reason. 
Are they really needles, Leonard? I just can't imagine. These are she... barbs, Alice. Barbs? Jungle natives use them in their blowguns. You mean they're part of a weapon? A very dangerous weapon. They're tipped with poison before they're used, a deadly poison. It can finish off a panther inside of 15 seconds. Leonard, we ought to get rid of her. Uh, now you've said that before, Alice, and you've always changed your mind. But this is different. How many lives may be in danger? I've handled her well enough up to now, Alice. So let me do this my own way. Uh, I'll talk to Tiki about these barbs sometime tonight. That evening, while Tiki was still at dinner with Alice, I excused myself a little earlier than usual and went up to her room. I gave the place a thorough search. And just as I found what I was looking for, Tiki came in. Oh, oh, hello, Tiki. Why are you here? I... I was looking for something. This. Juice. Strong juice. You keep... Yes, I'll keep it. Tiki, have more. Tiki, this stuff is very dangerous. I don't like you to fool around with it. I know her, too. That's beside the point. You're growing up now. You're learning fast. You shouldn't even want to keep this stuff. You angry, Tiki? Oh, no, of course not. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. You're as guileless as a child and as dangerous as... Well, as anything I've ever met. You like Tiki? Of course I like Tiki. And I certainly don't approve... What are you doing? Tiki like you. I... I don't think you should put your arms around a man, Tiki. No? Especially a... A married man... Tiki more like your wife. Tiki like you. No, 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 wait. Tiki like you very much. Tiki had her arms around my neck. And she was pressing her cheek to mine. It was ridiculous. I, I was over twice her age. But I must admit, in all fairness, that she was very provocative. evening, Bob Williams came over for dinner. After dinner, Alice and I retired to the living room, leaving Bob and Tiki alone on the porch outside. I could hear them rocking quietly on the swing, and for some odd reason, it annoyed me. What time is it, Alice? Ten past nine. Don't you think it's time that young man should be getting home to bed? At this hour? He only arrived at six. Yes, I know. Still, I don't like Tiki to stay up too late. It interferes with her work the following day. Leonard. Yes? Have you ever noticed the way she looks at you? Tiki? She seems to be getting very fond of you. Almost too fond, I should say. Oh, don't be silly, Alice. The girl admires me because I'm her instructor. That's all there is to it. I think it's more than that. Oh, you're wrong. Remember, dear, underneath it all, she's still a savage. And savages don't control their emotions in any way. I rather resent that, Alice. What? You heard me. You were shouting at me, Leonard. Well, I... I, I, I didn't mean to shout, but, but you've no right to refer to Tiki as a savage. Please, Leonard, we'll discuss this some other time. I don't want Bob to hear us. I think that young man ought to be on his way home. And I've half a mind to remind him of it. I... I'm sorry, Mrs. Higgins. I'll have to leave. So soon, Bob? If you want me to be frank about it, I'm sorry I even came. Oh, why? The girl is nothing more than an uncivilized devil. Had no I... right to ask me. Huh? Now, just a minute, young fellow. Bob, I... what's wrong with your hand? Why are you holding your handkerchief to your wrist? Would you like to see? Here. Why, oh, you've been hurt. I was bitten. What? Yes. She bit me like a dog, and for no reason. I had my hand on the back of the swing, and I was talking. Suddenly, she leaned over and sunk her teeth into my wrist. Bob, oh, that's horrible. Are you sure that you didn't annoy her? That... Annoy her? <laughs> that's rich. Really, Professor Higgins, you must think I'm some kind of an animal myself. Where is Tiki? Out in the swing? No, she ran away behind the house. When you get hold of her, I suggest you put a muzzle on her. And slap her into a cage. Tiki was wrong, of course. But I had a very strange reaction. When I looked at Bob's lacerated wrist where her pointed teeth had made four tiny holes, I almost felt relieved. And suddenly I knew why. I was jealous of Bob and of everyone else. From that point on, I just let myself go. Maybe there's something a little savage in all of us. Maybe it was just because... There was something wrong with me. But I became like Tiki. Wild, cruel, vicious. And then she led me exactly where I always knew she would lead me. Uh, Tiki. Yes? What are you doing? Make point for juice. Stop shopping at Bob. You angry, Tiki? 
Kiki, you, you can't go through with this. Why? Because it's, it's murder. I'll stand for anything, but, but not that. As long as she stay, Tiki no like. But we can't kill her, Tiki. She's done nothing. Alice must die. No other way. I... I'm not going to let you go through with this, Tiki. Then you leave with me? Leave? We go back to jungle together? Oh, no, no. No, I, I can't do that. Then Tiki get rid of Alice? Oh, wait. I... I'll go away with you. I... If you want me to. Now? I, in a day or so. Too long. But, but I could, just can't leave on the spur of the moment. I, I need money and other things besides. Tomorrow we go. Or you never see Tiki again. Oh, don't say that. Tomorrow we go. All right, Tiki. Tomorrow we go. But I was a fool. I knew Tiki wouldn't keep her word. She was a savage. She knew no mercy. For that matter, neither did I. And I realized it when I found Tiki in Alice's room. Tiki! Alice, no more. You... You've killed her. No more. She no can follow us. Did you... Did you use a dart? Yes. It worked fast. She died quick. You happy, yes? I... Very happy, Tiki. Now, you and Tiki both alike. We kill. We love. Yes, Tiki. Tiki teach you, Zango. You be just like Tiki. You even let her file your teeth. Yes, I... You try to make Tiki like civilized lady, but Tiki make you a jungle man. That's... That's just what you've done to me, Tiki. You, you've made me part of the jungle. Come close to Tiki. Tiki wants you to hold her in your arms. Uh... Oh, you're wonderful, Tiki. You're wonderful and exciting and horrible all at once. Kiss Tiki. Kiss Tiki heart. Well, that just about ends my experiment. And I've drawn some excellent conclusions. For one thing, I know how dangerous it is to play with jungle fire. For when you're burned, the scars will never heal. I've called the police but it's obvious that they won't arrive on time. They'll find Titi, but they won't find me. Her jungle instincts were stronger than her love for me, for she's prepared another cordon. And I can see her standing behind me now in the mirror above my desk. She has a small bamboo blowgun in her mouth. And... <gasps> she's an excellent shot. It's too bad, though. Yes, it's too bad. For science, I mean. I never actually found out the secret of head shrinking. it is dangerous to hurry time, especially where the jungle is concerned. And if you don't agree with me, you might reread the scientific observations of a true barbarian by the late Professor Leonard Higgins. The clock will be heard next week, same time. It is written by Lawrence Clee and narrated by Hart McGuire. As Professor Higgins, we heard Leonard Bullen with Lyndall Barber as Mrs. Higgins, Melpo Zaracosta as Tiki, and Ray Barrett as Bob. The clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. is a leisurely thing. But there are a few, a very few, who split their seconds carefully, knowing that each minute part may sometimes be of vast importance. Bad dining in a boxer may forfeit a champion's crown, and good dining in a racehorse can win or lose a fortune. But there is one man to whom an instant is always the narrow margin between life and sudden death. He is in Matador, the fighter of bulls, the idol of the masses when he is good, the object of insulting scorn when bad. He is a man who makes his living with the cape and the sword, and he never forgets he is always a tenth of a second from the grave. Buenos dias, senores. Permit me the honor of an introduction. I am Don Miguel Jose de Ibarra, formerly a matador of distinction, now a breeder of brave and distinguished bulls. 
My English is not so bad, no? <laughs> this is because I have learned it very well, and I speak in this language as often as possible. But in any language, the name of Tommy Guerrero is a household word, for my stock has proven its courage in the bull ring from Spain to Lima and back to Mexico. The terror of horrors have made me wealthy, and although I am now too slow and fast to enter the ring of the Torero, the thrill of the corrida has never left my blood. This, then, is the reason I became involved with Pedro. Yes, the same Pedro Villancho who became the greatest matador of the last decade. Only, when I met him first, he was a weak-looking youth who called on me at my breeding ranch and awoke me from an excellent sleep at midnight. Senor Ibarra? Si? I'm Pedro Villancho, senor. Well? I have come from the city a long way, senor, to see you. I have never heard of Pedro Villancho, and I'm too tired to talk to him. Senor, please don't close the door. It is very important. Why do you speak to me in English? Because I have been told it would please you. And uh, where did you learn your English? From my mother, senor. Her father was an American. Mm. And why do you come here at this hour and night uh, in your rags to disturb me? Because you are the greatest breeder of fighting bulls in the world, senor. Mm. And because you have been a master of the sword. Your tongue has oil on it. <laughs> hey, come inside. Oh, gracias, senor. <laughs> now, explain yourself. My time is short. Senor Ibarra, I want to learn to be a matador. something to offer. Have you now? <laughs> and what is that? Your skinny legs, your dirty fingers. <laughs> to be a matador, one must be a man. I have practiced with the cape and sword for many years, senor, since I was a child. All I need now is the hand and the knowledge of a master. And perhaps I will show you another hotelito. Uh, si, and perhaps I will show you a door. Senor, if you will spare me five minutes and come out to the corral. My corral? Si, I have been practicing there. Practicing with my bulls? You fool, do you want to ruin them? Don't you know that, that, they, that they are never shown the cape until they enter the ring? I only made a few passes with one, senor. The big black one with the eyes that flash like the devil. You mean Bibora, the, the viper? If that was his name, senor. What do you mean, was? Come with me, senor, and I will show you. He took me out to my corral, where Bibora was quartered. Bibora, the bull that was built like a steam engine. The moon was bright and the corral was quiet. Bora was lying just outside the pen. There he is, senor. Si, there he is, and I wish now I were asleep as he is. You do not wish that, senor, for he is not asleep. The boy, you say. What? Look for yourself, senor. Si, si, he is dead. How did you assassinate him? I did not assassinate him, senor Ibarra. I killed him honorably. I placed the banderilla as myself. I found him in the barn with the sword. I played him with the pig for twelve minutes. After I placed it out, I killed him with an estocada. It is impossible. The sword is well placed, senor. No horse, Mr. Picadores. One of my best bulls that you killed. You will forgive me, senor, for taking the liberty. But I will repay you for the bull when I make my first appearance in the ring. I want you to manage me, senor Ibarra. I want you to make me the greatest matador who ever lived. Will you do it? Very well, Pedro. I will get you. Ah, bueno, Pedro. Oh, tell me, Greg. Have I learned my lesson? Ah, oh, you've learned it well, Pedro. You are not ready for your debut in the provinces. Your debut in the capital depends on how well you do there. However, I have bad news for you. Bad news? I will not be able to accompany you on your tour. I must make a trip away on urgent business. That is too bad, Don Miguel. You, you don't seem to be very disturbed by the news. Why should I be disturbed? My technique is perfect, and no bull can frighten me. So, so you can do without me now. I teach you all you know, and this is your thing. I will repay you for your instruction. From now on, I need no help from anyone. So now that I left the country, and remain away for half a year, now and then I would receive reports concerning Pedro. Then I learned of his amazing triumphs in the ring. His attitude when we parted 
would have angered me for many months. Had it not been for a little triumph of my own. For I met Doris. A young and beautiful Doris. And my life from that point on had reached its peak. <laughs> I would like to go where we can talk. Uh, the garden is empty. Mm-hmm. Well, then it's time to come to see you. You are very lovely, Doris. Lovelier than any woman I have ever met. Do you know that? Yes. You are a woman, Doris, who deserves a perfect setting. Like some fantastic emerald. In my country, I, I am a man of some importance, and I'm rich. Perhaps, perhaps you might find a younger man more handsome, but you will never meet one who is so willing to make you happy and give you everything you ever wanted. Are you asking me to marry you, Miguel? Yes. Does it shock you? Shock me? I love you, Doris. Mary. There is nothing in the world I wouldn't do to have you and to kiss you. If you would just give your consent. What makes you think that I'm in love with you? That is unimportant. Are you sure? I know I could make you happy. And just having you with me for the rest of my life is enough. Okay? I am not young. I have my faults. But what I offer you outweighs them all. Okay? There is one thing I demand in return. And what is that? Honor in my country is more important than life itself. The pride we feel in our males and in our families. If you accept me, you must promise never to break that honor in any way. Will you, will you give me your answer tomorrow, Doris? You can have my answer now, Miguel. And the answer... Within a month, my new bride and I were back on your arms. Which she began to roar like the queen I knew she was meant to be. Oh, I was happy. Happier than I have ever been in my life. But sometimes, happiness can be a prelude to despair. Who is Pedro Vidian's show? Why do you ask? Oh, I heard the servants talking about it a little while ago. They seem to idolize him. Vidian's show is a matador. A good one? Mm, as good as I could make him. Then you know him. Oh, silly. What's he like? He's handsome, skillful, and courageous. He's also vain, egotistical, vulgar, conceited, loud, and stupid. <laughs> mm. Ah, he sounds interesting. I like to see him fight. But you said you don't like him to fight. I like it when it's done well. The Pedro should not be disappointing. Will you take me? Si, caritissima. I will take you this Sunday. Oh, my God, it's wonderful. Oh, he's like to see it. Round of applause. It's the beginning of the camp. Yes, and no one kills the way Pedro does. I'll watch him now as he throws here and goes in with his sword.
If you're a registered nurse or about to become one, why not investigate the opportunities open to nurses in the United States Air Force Reserve? Assignment opportunities are available now for flight nurses in the Aeromedical Evacuation Reserve Program. Visit or write the 945th Military Airlift Group, Hill Air Force Base, Utah, or phone 777-3330. Most of us can never know when death will strike. To the sick, it may come at midnight. To the soldier, at the break of dawn. But the fighter of bulls is always aware that death may eventually greet him. Before the sun has set. Good evening, Don Miguel. Good evening. Your invitation was a great surprise. I had thought that you were uh, angry with me. Mm. One can never be angry with an artist, Pedro, when one has a great respect for the art. I have come far since last we met. I am aware of that. Good evening. Uh, Pedro, Senor Ibarra. This is Pedro Villancio, Doris. How did you do? An honor, Senor. You have no idea how thrilled I am to meet you. I thought you were wonderful in the room yesterday afternoon. If I had known you were there, Signore, I would have dedicated my second bull to you. Oh. Promise me you'll do that the next time I come. You have my word for it. <clears throat> uh, uh, would you listen to me before dinner, darling? That sounds very good. I'll give it a Excuse me. She is a beautiful woman. Young. What was her age to do it? Nothing, Miguel. I was nearly uh, thinking. That's all. Yeah. He was thinking. And so was I. When a fighting bull is bad, he is bad for one or three reasons. He is either lame or cowardly or blind. Perhaps this may also apply to a man in love. But I am not lame, senor. Nor cowardly. Nor am I blind. I could see that Pedro was stealing my wife. And to me, that meant my end. And I am not quite so stupid as a bull. You are Pedro Viancho's confidential servant, Juan de Palma. Uh, si, Don Miguel. And you are present before the fight when the bulls are paired and chosen by lot. Uh, si. The windy papers are marked and placed in the hat. I picked on Pedro's bulls for the afternoon. Why not? I have contracted to supply six bulls for the Carida on the 27th. Oh, Pedro is fighting then. Si. One of these bulls is El Cuchillo. A prize I have bred myself. His weight is half a ton, and his bravery is only matched by the length of his horns. I want to make certain Pedro wins El Cuchillo. Very certain. It seems to me that a man with intelligence and skill could arrange to... Choose the right slip of paper for his mother door when the time arrives. A little sleight of hand, perhaps. It can be done. Don Miguel, if I am discovered, it will be my finish. One. How would you like to retire from the ring? Retire? With 100,000 American dollars as a pension. But what are you planning, senor? Can I trust you? See. Si. If you repeat this to anyone, you are finished, Pepe Alman. As a torero, and as a man. I will not breathe a word. I swear it. A few days before El Cuchillo is shipped to the capital to fight, I will play with him myself with the cape. No, I... I will get him used to the cape and the muleta. He will be a wise animal, Del Palma. A very wise animal when he faces Pedro. But, Don Miguel, what is murder? No bull can fight twice. Second time, he is sure to go for the man and not the king. Exactly. No. This I can't agree to. Hey, Look. I have the money here. The money to make you rich. Will you take it? See, Don Miguel. I will take it. until one week before Pedro's corrida, and then I dismissed my ranch hands. I wanted to be alone when I thought El Cuchillo, how much nicer it feels to drive his horn into a man and not into an empty cape. He responded well to my parcels. He was a brave and powerful bull, and finally in the midst of the Veronica, I realized that 
Oh, Cochillo had at last learned the difference between the cape and the matador who held it. You are ready to leave, Doris? The fight begins at four. Miguel, I don't think I'd enjoy the bullfight today. But Pedro is fighting. It is his last performance for the season. And I have supplied my finest moves. I... I don't think it would be better if I didn't go. Why? Miguel, there's something I've been wanting to talk to you about for quite a while. It concerns you and me and Pedro. Look now, Doris. I don't want to hear about it now. First, we will go to the fight. And you can tell me what you want to tell me later. The corridor today may change your mind. Change my mind about what? Many things. I love you, Doris. More than life itself. I can forgive you for anything, and I would do anything to keep you. Only Quill, I... I insist, Doris, that we leave for the plaza now. Very well, Miguel. I'm ready when you are. It's Pedro! See, si. this boy is for him, El Cuchillo, an excellent specimen. Very shortly. It was plain to see that the bull had not yet gotten used to the ring and the crowd. And when he charged, he charged in the usual manner. But to the eyes of an expert, his hooking was dangerous. Now came Pedro. He managed to perform an excellent series of passes with the cape. And the picardos rode out on their horses. It was here that the bull began to remember. And it was here that he became 1,200 pounds of death on the hook. They are ready to break the bandilla. The bull seems too fresh, though. This one is a dangerous animal. Pedro will have to take care. You almost sound as if you'd like to see him, sir. Perhaps I would. Think well. Why shouldn't I? He tried to steal you, didn't he? For all I know, he's already succeeded. Oh, please, that was what I was trying to tell you before, Miguel. Before we left the house. That he's already won you, Doris. He never tried to win me, and he never could. Oh. Pinto is your friend, Miguel. No matter how conceited you think he is. When he knew that he'd fallen in love with me, he said he was going away. He, he told you that? He knows how happy I am with you, darling. He would rather die than come between us. This is his farewell performance, Miguel. He will never come to this country again. He was going away. He, he was not... Poor Juan de Palma. How could he be such a fool? Why did he go into the ring while you? He lost me, girl. Speak it, Doris. Where are you going? Here you are. I'm going to ask the authorities to stop the fight. Guard. Guard, send me to the authorities. Get me through this mob. Relax, senor. We allow no one to enter the bar. Watch the finish, senor. There is a matador who is worthy of his hand. But you don't understand. Look how he talks to you. His hand is as heavy as an iron rail. The boy will kill him. He will die beneath the horn. Now he is in. And Pedro is down. His sword is gone. It has hit the woman. The woman? Doris.
just gotten out of the service. You've been home for a while, and you want to start thinking about your life and how you can get it going in the right direction. Okay, here's something to think about. The National Guard has a try-one program for prior servicemen. You join for a year. You get extra money you can use for school or that new car. And you can get further training you can use for a civilian job. If you're a prior serviceman, ask about the Try One program in the Army and Air National Guard. Retribution reaps its own reward. And if I may be permitted to paraphrase once more, I would say this. Though the mills of death grind slowly, yet they grind exceedingly small. Though with patience, death stands waiting with exactness. Grinds he all. The clock will be heard next week, same time. Written by Lawrence Clee, Hart McGuire narrates as the clock. As Miguel, Doris, and Pedro, we heard Owen Weingott, Moira Redmond, and Leon Pierce, together with Al Garcia as Juan. The clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. Oh.